Well, good morning. How is everyone? Are there any tractor pullers in the audience? I apologize if that was traumatic for you. We, uh, when we were making our uh, presentation here, we were trying to uh, find an example that was relatable to most people in the room that uh, was an example of something failing because of uh, a preventative maintenance issue or something like that. And so Lord knows what happened, but that's pretty catastrophic. So sorry if that triggered anybody in here. My name's Troy McCowan. I'm the uh, Western sales lead uh, for Precision Planning. Matt is the Eastern sales lead. He'll be up here in just a little bit. Um, do we have folks from Ukraine here? Did I hear you guys are in the room? Right in the front row. All right, I can see you. Welcome. Thanks for coming just down the road to see us. Not very often do I get to see people that traveled further than I did. I'm from South Dakota, but they came a lot further than that to come see us. So welcome to everybody that traveled in to see us. Glad you got here safe. Um, today we're going to do something just a little bit different in this session, though. A lot of times here, what we'll talk about is the next latest and greatest technology, some cutting edge research that we're looking at and trying to understand you know, where the next level of opportunity is. And Matt and I live in a little bit different world. We oversee the, uh, the region managers and the region managers oversee the dealers and we all work together to try to help solve problems in the spring. So the best phone call that we can get in the middle of April or May is something's not right, help me. I'm okay taking that phone call. Please don't ever hesitate to make that phone call. Let us know how we can help. Because then Matt and I live in a different world in June. In June, about June 15th, June 20th, 30th, occasionally you'll get that phone call. And it's one of two things on the phone when the phone rings. You got to come see this. Or get out here. Unfortunately, as you know, things evolve, we rarely get the phone call of the, this is amazing, come see it. It's usually on the other end. And so we're going to talk about things today to try to prevent that last phone call because you don't want to see it any worse than we do. Um, but if you do need help in season, feel free to reach out to us. Now, part of what we're going to talk about in here is, uh, is technology failing, whether that's uh, my laptop hard drive crashing right before a presentation. That was, that was not a good day. Somebody forgot to back it up on the cloud, and when the hard drive goes to the blue screen of death on my computer, that's no good. But uh, sometimes on these planners, and especially now as these trade cycles are starting to change just a little bit, these planners have a little more wear than they're supposed to on them. The acres per row is starting to climb on these planners. Some of these folks that were trade, trading planners every single year, they're two or three years now. And the guys that were selling them every two or three years, it's five or six years now. And so we're gonna talk about a few of the things that we see in the field that cause technology to fail, no different than blowing the motor out of the truck. Okay, this is not an exhaustive list. The guys that are in the black shirts, it says Precision Planning here, and it'll have their logo and, and their name on their shirts, they can help you with the full list. They've got documents there at the dealerships, and we'll refer to those a couple of times while we're in here. But we want to make sure that we catch the big frequent flyers, and so we're going to talk our way through the planner pass and, uh, and understand potential. Okay. Now, oftentimes, corn is not your only crop. For those of us joining us on the simulcast down in Texas, cotton is king. If it works in cotton, we'll talk about the corn acre. And if I go to Fargo up northeast of my place, uh, they want to know, does it fit my sugar beet acre first? Because if it fits the sugar beet acre, I'll apply that to my corn acre. And for the guys up in Canada, they may be looking at edible beans. Or if you go west of me, they're looking at wheat and they're looking at sunflowers or whatever. But we're going to start today talking about corn. Okay? And the reason we talk about corn is because we have logged over 3 million plants in the last decade. And I guess when I say we, Matt, that wasn't you and I. I've done a couple thousand, I suppose. Well, that, that's probably an embellishment. It's probably more hundreds. But the 3 million looks like this. It's somebody with a device in their hand walking out to a field and they look down and they say, good plant, bad plant. Good plant, bad plant. And they do that 3 million times over the last decade. And so we've really started to understand that as we flag those and we log them and we come back and we weigh those ears and we understand the yield, that a mistake here costs this and a mistake there like that one costs this. And so it looks a little bit like what you see on the screen. My expectation is that I'm going to purchase a seed 
And Matt's gonna tell you the cost of that seed here a little bit later, but I'm gonna put that seed in the ground and I expect it to produce a plant that produces fruit. Whether that's a bowl of cotton or whether that's a sugar beet or a sunflower head or corn or soy, it doesn't really matter what the plant is. We have yet to find one that does not respond well to proper planting. And so the explanation we're gonna use up here today is just on corn. And so the expectation is one seed, drop it in the ground, create 500 to 700 kernels an ear, right? There's a couple ways to start losing that full potential of that ear, and that's if I crowd the neighboring plant just a little bit, okay? Take a little bit of the elbow room away from it, I end up to where I lose a tenth of an ear because I have too much competition. If I severely misplace that seed and I get real close to the neighbors and I don't have any elbow room as a plant, I start to pull that back just a little further. They're minor issues, but they're worth solving. Next, we go to a singulation problem, and that's your meter. You'll see up here on the stage, we've got a number of different metering discs for all the different crops, including a hemp disc up here. If you guys wanna drill your own hemp disc, I'll show you that later. But on the singulation side of things, I need to understand that a double laying two seeds side by side is starting to pull back yield in the neighborhood of four tenths of an ear. A skip, when I'm supposed to drop a seed and nothing comes out, I lose eight tenths of an ear. Now, why is that not 10 tenths of an ear? When I skip, how come I'm not losing the whole ear? We have some flex on the neighbors, right? Glad everybody's awake this morning, that's good. Audience participation's a lot more fun for the guy up here on stage, so thank you. Okay, so eight tenths of an ear, the neighbors are helping flex. Now here's the big boy. This is the one to really get right. Okay, when the plant comes out of the ground late compared to its neighbors, it has a significant yield loss. If it's one collar, Okay, it's a 50% yield loss. If it's two collars, it's a weed. Now, it's pretty severe in corn. When I go to sugar beets, this is death. Spacing problems, singulation problems, emergence. It's a much, much higher penalty for me in the sugar beet area. Sunflower, same way. You guys like eating sunflower seeds? They have to be a certain size, and they have to be a certain moisture, and they can't be blonde, and they can't have foreign matter, and the size of the head changes that. So we wanna pay attention to it. Now, does anybody in here know what the new world record is for yield on corn? 616. In South Dakota, where I'm from, we call that a logistics problem. We don't know how to handle 200 bushel corn, nonetheless 600 bushel corn, right? But it tells me there's opportunity out there, okay? If you go to any of their seminars, if you listen to Dr. Fred Below from Illinois tell you about his seven wonders of the corn yield world, if you listen to anybody in a black shirt or a white shirt today, they will tell you that the plants have to come out of the ground correctly at the same time to have the highest yield potential. Now, 10 years ago, you'd hear somebody up here on the stage and they'd say, you know, if we could just get the first one out of the ground and get the rest of the field within 24 to 48 hours, we're doing good and we've got it. Fast forward five years and they're gonna say, actually, we think it's closer to 12 to 36 hours. And now in the most recent uh, reading and successful farming, I think is where I saw it, or it was on Twitter, one of the two. Might have been a successful farming on Twitter, I'm not sure. But they said it's within hours. That the goal to hit the high yield is get them all out of the ground within a same hour of each other. The expectation's getting higher, isn't it? Okay, but that seed has to get out of there. Now the beautiful part of this whole thing, spacing errors are maintenance and mechanical problems. Singulation problems, their maintenance and mechanical setup issues. And emergence is largely based on management choices. The best part of this role that I have covering the Western US, okay, I've seen every type of farming, strip till and conventional till and muddy and dry and everything in between. When I walk on a farm and I can help you adjust nuts and bolts on that planter and improve what you're already doing, that's an awesome day because that's opportunity. You thought you were doing it as well as you could but that's opportunity that we have control over. I can't help you with complex chemistry. I can't help you with weather. I can't help you with the soils that are in your field. But if it's nuts and bolts, that's in our control and that's a great day on the farm to find that opportunity. So let's talk specifically what happens. As I start to look at spacing areas that are out on the farm, they're caused by a couple different things. For at least two generations and maybe three or four, you have been told that speed kills a planter. Why? Why do we think? Row units bounce, right? 
As I drive faster, that row unit starts to chatter. So this spring, I got to plant corn for the very first time by myself. It used to be that I sit in the, uh, the buddy seat. You guys call us out to help you, or we're helping train dealers, and I get to sit in the buddy seat, and I get to reach right in front of you and go, tick, tick, tick. See, that was really easy. All you got to do is just adjust the monitor. It's a little different when everybody leaves the field and the trucks all leave, and it's you and a planner and success or failure. The tension's just a tick higher at that point, right? And suddenly the expert's not quite an expert anymore. But when I get out in the field and I'm repairing row 48 on the planter, I set my brand new CT pliers right up on top of it. And I jump back in the cab and I go take off planting. And eight acres later, I have to get out and fix something over on that right wing again. I go to grab my pliers and they're gone. Anybody ever plant your pliers? They're Roundup resistant. You know that, right? <laughs> okay. I go back over to row 48 and those pliers are still sitting there. That's pretty smooth, right? Eight acres in and those pliers are still sitting on top of that row unit. I don't have a row unit ride problem. My row units are not bouncing. When they're bouncing, they play with spacing on the meter. They change the depth of the planter. They change how your closing wheels and row cleaners work. So the whole industry told you to slow down. And then we came out with speed tube and we said, speed up. Now the key to going fast is you can't have a yield drag if we're gonna go faster, right? We have to pin those row units to the ground. We do that with downforce and we carry that seed from the meter all the way to the ground. That enables you to go seven, eight, 10 mile an hour. If you wanna be the one guy on Snapchat that grabs his phone, speeds up to 15, takes a picture and slows back down, you can do that too. We had a lot of those guys here yesterday. It's always yesterday's joke, right? That's like free beer tomorrow, okay? We wanna make sure there's no driveline chatter, the ground drive wheels aren't dragging, we don't have hydraulics and chains and things that are pulsing on the planter. When I get to singulation, it's simply a meter. We're gonna show you that here in just a second. Drop one single seed every single time, doesn't matter what the crop is, doesn't matter where you farm. And then lastly, we start to look at the management choices inside of emergence. There's three things that have to happen to get a seed out of the ground. I have to have a little moisture, I have to have a little temperature, and I have to have a little bit of oxygen. Jason Webster just got done telling you that planting date mattered. What disappeared out of those three things? Moisture, heat, or oxygen? Which one fell apart? The heat gun said it went to 41 degrees, and that's why they lost the germination, right? So this is all monitoring and understanding what's happening with your ground conditions as we're planting, okay? So we'll dive into this in four key areas. Number one, as you look at these two row units to my right and to my left, your right and left over here, they're all painted white, right? Does everybody know what rows those are? Because it's throwing everybody for a loop this week. They're looking at it going, you know, that looks awful like something I've seen before. You guys have planted for four generations on their farm with the same color iron. We just painted the OEM stuff white, okay? These are the four most popular uh, brands of planter units in North America. And all of our stuff is the stuff that's not white. But all four of these, despite the marketing claims that they have, do the exact same job. They open a ditch, they dump a seed, they cover it up, and they move on. Now, there's some nuances in that, right? But we have to understand, how do we open a furrow correctly? How do I place a seed correctly? And how do I destroy that furrow correctly? And then how do I know what's going on? And so let's get into that just a little bit. First things first, I have to take my bar and I have to lay it down on the ground to tow those row units through, right? I am wanting to pay attention very carefully to the bar that the row units are attached to, okay? That's the first place to watch. That bar has to be flat. If it's leaned forward on its nose, that's gonna lift this row unit forward. If it's leaned on its back, it leans the row unit backwards. They're designed to run flat through the field. So parallel arms should be nice and flat. We wanna make sure as we get into bigger planters that those wings aren't starting to float on you, okay? This thing should not look like a bird going through a field. Should not be hunchbacked either. So we wanna do this in motion, get in it next, uh, run next to it in a, a UTV of your choice or in a pickup or something, but watch outside of the cab and make sure that that bar is leveled out nice and flat. Then we need to make sure that it weighs enough, okay? When I go to the field and I try to apply downforce on a row unit, whether that's a spring, an airbag, or a hydraulic cylinder, I wanna make sure that I have enough weight in that bar that when I start to increase downforce here, that I have something to push against. So the story goes like this. These are some pictures I took in South Dakota uh, back in 2017 or 18, one of the two. 
Those two years, we had a D1 to a D3 drought going in the Dakotas on level of severity. Depended on what side of the road you were standing on and how bad it was. But as we deploy to the field, we put a couple thousand dollars a row on each one of those planters and we take off to the field and 200 yards in, it's waving its arms at us and it's saying, absolutely no go, stop. For the guys in the black shirts, the monitor was saying blue, 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 blue on the downforce map. And what blue tells the person that's never seen a 2020 is this sensor right here that gets a weight on it when the gauge wheel touches it, meaning we hit depth. The blue says, I haven't seen weight, you're shallow, you're shallow, you're shallow, you're shallow. How long do you want to plant in a drought? Shallow. About this far, right? Okay, and so what we did is I, I get in the cab, we look at the maps, we check the systems, systems are all operating correctly. I now have three options to give the grower. Slow down. Do you suppose that goes well with a 90 foot planter on big fields? They're not gonna slow down, right? Number two, shallow up. A planter set shallower takes less force to push into the ground. They're not gonna do that either. We had to chase moisture that year. It was gonna take two and a half inches to find moisture in those fields and we were not gonna get rain after it planted. So we had to be there. And option number three is we better hang some weight on that bar. Now we had planned for this ahead of time. I said, if we get going and we don't see the ground contact that I'm looking for, I'm gonna need you to bring those weights to me. I said, let's make a plan so it's not a half day adventure to make this happen. And that's the picture of the payloader bringing me the skid of suitcase weights. We already had the brackets sitting there. We hang them on there. We bolt them down, make sure they won't fall off and life is good. We go planting, everything's fine. Okay, this revolves around Newton's third law. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. This is physics, right? I have to have something here to push against when I start to apply down force. So let's take a simple example. I have an eight row planter. I'm going to apply 200 pounds of down force. How much should my bar weigh to stay in the ground? At least 1,600 pounds. Those of you that are up here from uh, the Mississippi Delta or Texas or Western uh, Nebraska, Eastern Colorado, some of those areas where three-point planters are really popular. A planter toolbar that's seven by seven is about 35 to 45 pounds per foot. There's not a lot of weight in those bars. There's not a lot of extra iron hanging off of them in order to help hold it down. So what some people have to do is they go in and they put a bunch of rebar right down the middle of that bar to help hold it down. Or they'll put some flat stock in there or they'll put round stock. I've seen them put sand and I've seen them put concrete. Don't do the concrete. That's kind of a, kind of a tough one to get back out if you get it wrong, okay? I've seen guys put saddle tanks on there and fill them full of water. But we have to have something to hold that bar down or your downforce is gonna pop it right back up. So it's super important to get that right. Once that bar is leveled out and ballasted down, now all I have to do is attach a row unit to it because it is nothing more than a towing vessel. When I attach the row unit to the bar, I use parallel, parallel arms to make that happen. Any rocking motion that's in those is gonna change my depth and my seed delivery. So this planter here is one row out of a 16 row planter that's parked out back. We ran this this summer, it planted a 2019 crop. If you came up to inside PTI where uh, Jason's at, you had an opportunity to plant with this planter this summer. Parallel arms look like this. Would you give that an A or an F? I'm gonna give it a thumbs down. It's time to replace. We have to make sure that that row unit cannot pivot and twist and turn. So it can't move top left, top right. It can't wobble left and right, it can't rock back and forth. We want very, very little movement in that to make sure that those parallel arms are solid. Then we have to hang a disc opener on the planter. How big should a brand new disc opener for this row unit be? It's about 15 inches for a brand new one. This row unit over there, it's 16 inches. That one that's over there is 14 inches. They're gonna vary. Depends on the manufacturing, depends on the age. This particular one on stage is 15. How much wear should it have before we replace them? About a half inch. Now I come from South Dakota and things are a little more frugal in parts of that state. And so as we're putting new disc openers on one planter, we're taking the old ones off at 14 and a half and we're putting them in a pile to recycle them and take them in with scrap. And the neighbor walks in and he said, what are you doing? We said, we're putting new disc openers on. He said, well, what are you doing with those? We said, we're gonna scrap them and he picks them up, puts a tape on them. He says, 14 and a half, that's better than the 13 and a half that I've got. And he literally loads them into his truck and he leaves. That is improving for him, 
right? It may not be right, but it's better than where he was, okay? Now, when we put new disc, opener, new disc openers on, we want to run a bolt through them and spin them on a vise. And if you see that disc opener start to wobble in there, you know you got a bent blade before you ever get it installed. If it passes that test and it runs true straight up and down, lay it over on its back like you see in the bottom center and put a screwdriver on the table and give it a spin. We have caught times where that hub is not in the center of a disc. Now, it's not one manufacturer, it's not one style, it's not one color or anything like that. It just happens, right? They've got a jig, it punches holes, they move it down the line and install the hub, and sometimes they get out around. I'd love to know that before I install it on the planter. Okay, once that disc opener's in good shape and I've determined the bearings are good, now I get to put it on the shank, but there's one last piece. And this is a story out of uh, Nebraska this year, and I have to shame myself a little bit on stage this week because I miss this. A new opener or a new seed tube guard is on the bottom left-hand side, or on the left-hand side of that screen. Right-hand side is a worn one. How do you think the shimming on that disc system was on that row on the right? Not real good. It's pretty narrow. When we look up the bottom of the row unit, you see the guard in the middle and you see a gap between that and the disc openers. When I push the disc opener in the ground, what's gonna happen? It's gonna push in, right? And so here's the rest of the story. On the right-hand side of this picture, you will see row eight on a plot planner. On the left-hand side, you will also see row eight of that same plot planner. And so here's the call that I get. Again, this is a June, July type phone call. It says, Troy, you better figure out what's going on. We've got all this money invested in this planner and it's dragon seed. We think it's the seed firmer. Okay, why do you think that? Because it's the last thing that we changed. Theory of he who touched it last is at fault, right? All right. So they go out and look at it and they said, hey, when we built this thing this spring, we went through it and I quote, tip to tail. So my RM goes out there or our RM, I guess I don't own him, so it's not my, but anyway, the RM goes out there and looks at it. He goes, I can't see it. You take a look. You're really good at this stuff. And so I come down there. We go to the first plot day and I can't find it. Everything's tight. Parallel arms are good. We're leveled. We're ballasted. We're running through the ground good. Second plot day the next week, we go down and this planter sat in the ground. We took the closing wheels off of it because I wanted to look at the open furrows like you see up here because we're talking about how to set down force, right? And I get to look and it stopped in the ground. It's leveled down and the seed firmer, the Keaton uh, smart firmer is down in there. And that smart firmer is down in the furrow and I can stick my finger between the bottom of the furrow and the bottom of the smart firmer. You guys ever have that moment where you have just a small brain lapse and you're kind of in a panic because people are looking over your shoulder and you decide the best thing that I can do is grab my phone, right? Somebody else will be able to help me. And so what I did in 13 years of experience, and I give a presentation like this 60 times a year, and I do know better, I promise you that. But I send a text message to Dale Cook. Dale Cook is the head of the Smart Firmer team. And I said the following, Dale, should a Smart Firmer be at the bottom of the furrow or not? Send. Do any of you guys know how to unsend a text message? I don't, and nobody this week has been able to help me on this, <laughs> because about four seconds later, I went, you idiot. Of course it's supposed to be at the bottom. The whole point of a firmer is to tuck seed into the bottom of a furrow, right? Luckily, Dale didn't look at his phone for a couple hours, right? And what I found and looked at that, I said, why is the firmer not in the bottom of it? One of two things, the furrow is too narrow or the smart firmer is too wide. I'm pretty sure that team is smart enough to figure out the size of what that needs to fit in the bottom of a standard furrow. And so I looked at the group that we were with and I said, hey, before that next group of people comes through on the rotation of this plot, how far is the deer dealer from here? And they said, 20 minutes round trip, why? I said, here's the part number, this is what I need. Can you hurry up and get it for us? And so we told the first group as they were coming through, we have a hypothesis of what's happening here. The second group, we said, give us a few more wrenches and we'll get this done, we'll tell you for sure at lunch. And what we found at lunch was that a 5 8 inch wide uh, seed tube guard at the bottom versus the 15 16 or inch wide that a brand new one is makes a world of difference in the width of a furrow. And that's the difference in that picture. You know what the cost of that repair is? $10.28 or something like that with tax. Thousands of dollars of technology deployed that are being not utilized to their full potential over 10 bucks. Now, the question is, how in the world did they miss that? How did you miss that, and how did your RM miss that? 
Well, here's what happens. When they tear a planter down like this, and we've got dealers in the room that have built the plot planters, they tear it all the way down to the shank. They take everything off because they're going to inspect it. And they said, you know what? We're going to make a marketing piece out of this too. It should look right. Down the road to the powder coater it goes. So they powder coated the whole thing and they brought it back and guess what got powder coated? The old seed tube guard. And they just flat missed it. And we missed it and it's an honest mistake, right? It was never intentional to destroy, but it's a great story. When you get those narrowed up like that, it side loads your bearings and hubs and you'll start to see some bearing failure or hub failure, okay? We have to attach gauge wheels and discs to that planter. And when we're gapping those discs, it's pretty simple. I'm gonna grab two business cards and I'm gonna come from the bottom up and I'm gonna come from the top down. And I'm gonna measure the gap in between those two business cards. Now, depending on the thickness of the blade and the manufacturer of the row unit that we're working with, you're gonna have a different gap that is recommended for you. Our premier dealers have a document that they can download and hand to you that tells you what the actual specs of each of those different situations are gonna be. It's pretty simple. Okay, and once those are installed right, we get rid of the W bottom on the bottom left, we get rid of the narrow furrow on the right. Now we have to start attaching disc or uh, gauge wheels to it, and I want good integrity on my gauge wheels, so they should not wobble. They should not be able to freely spin when they're up against the row unit. I want them nice and tight against the disc opener so no dirt can get in between. What will happen is this. When I get a gap between the disc opener and the gauge wheel, you're gonna see that rooster tail of dry dirt. You see, uh, the, the furrow becomes almost like water when we go through that with a disc opener. It flows just like boat wake out away from the disc opener and it comes right back together at the back. And what you're looking for is enough time to get the seed to the bottom of the furrow before that dry dirt comes back. And so when we leave that gap, it gets inside the rim of the, of the gauge wheel and it's gonna fall down into the furrow. Dry soil underneath the seed is no good for germination, right? And so let's go back and we'll look at this again. This is the same planter on the same day. That's a quarter inch gap between the disc opener. And the next picture is a few rows to the right of this one where it's shimmed in nice and tight. For those of you with a keen eye, it's not the difference in the gauge wheel, it's the difference in the shimming. Okay, we don't want any of that dry dirt down in the furrow. Now when we look at these gauge wheels, when we attach them, something has to stop this gauge wheel arm from coming up, and that's how we're determining depth on the planter. And so that picture right there, for those that aren't aware with it, is this spot right here that we have circled. When this comes up and engages the mustache at the top right of that picture up there, they start to walk when we go through the field and it will wear a little bit of a pivot here. Okay, just a little dimple or a really big dimple when we get to the other side of it. If y'all can see that dimple on there. Now is this the left gauge wheel arm or the right gauge wheel arm? The answer is yes. Okay, left, right, they're interchangeable, right? Now the problem is, is if I put some of those rows on the right and some of those rows on the left, I now have a variable depth planter, correct? You didn't even have to pay for it and you got the variable depth planter. We have to be careful on this and so there's variable wear that will occur on these gauge wheel arms. You see it on the Kinsey down here in the bottom right hand corner where the dog bone touches the gauge wheel arm. Those pivots are gonna wear in a little bit and so what we need to do is a block check. We're gonna set the planter for depth, set it down on top of the blocks. We're gonna measure the distance between the disc opener and the concrete. Or we can do it this way, bigger blocks and let's slide some stacks of washers underneath the disc opener. The goal is to have the stack of washers identical from row to row. How many people in here have done a block check? Nick, what'd you find? Variation? A little bit? Variation? How much? Quarter inch, maybe more, who else has done one? Did you see variation? Did anybody do this test and not see any variation? Anybody? Matt, we struck out again. I have asked now, we gotta add every day's totals into this. I think we're up to about 7,400 people in the last six years I have asked that question to. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of the guys will raise their hand and say, yes, we've done that check. 3.5 guys have said, we found nothing. How do you get 0.5 guys? I'll explain that because it happened yesterday. I'm looking for number four and I can't find guy number four. But the guy yesterday, yesterday said it depends and so I have to give him like a half. 
That's how we get to a 0.5 guy. But either those three guys have the best planters known to man or they misunderstood the process, right? Chances are you're going to find variation and most people will find between a quarter inch and three quarters of an inch of depth variability across that planter. So it's pretty simple. All I have to do is take this T-handle right here and I adjust it a quarter notch or a half notch or a full notch or whatever it is and that will true up the depth. If I do it with that row unit over there, there's a nut back on the back and I can change that so that they're all the same. I'm told at the meeting on Tuesday when people were here that I can go to the case dealer and get a tool for the front side of that row unit that will help me zero that planter out as well. Okay, now if you're gonna adjust the T-handle, you better put a metal mark on both sides because the guy in North Dakota had his grandkids come out in the shop after he did his 36 row and they got to playing with all the handles. And he got to do it twice. It goes a lot faster once you have the blocks made, but make the blocks and save them because you'll need them again next year. But what happens is this, when you see this on the screen, this is a soybean emergence picture. And of course the question is what happened? Rows two, three, and four are good. Something's wrong with row one. You see it coming at you and going away. And the first thing that Matt and I are gonna do when we come to the field is we're gonna look at this plan and we're gonna block check it. And what you see on the notepad up there in the left is the stack of washers measurement. That is not planting depth, that's the stack of the washers. So the bigger the washers get, the shallower I planted. And there's a 5 eighths of an inch variation between row one and row four. And that's probably enough to lose one of three things, either moisture, temperature, or oxygen. Which one did I lose? Probably moisture. Okay, it's a little bit of a struggle when we do that. So once I've got the bar ballasted leveled, the row unit's good, and I've created a furrow that's got a nice V to it. I don't have dry dirt in the bottom of it. There's no residue. It's at the moisture line. All I have to do is get a seed there, right? It's pretty simple. So what we have to do is we have to take the heartbeat of the planter, also known as a meter, and get a seed to go all the way through it. How many of you can smell those meters in your mind right now? I hate that smell, right? And so what we want to do is encourage you to get your meters tested every single year. It's the only thing that touches the seed before it goes to the ground. And so each of our dealers will have a black stand like that. It's called a Meter Max Ultra. Okay, and it can take most of the row units that are on the marketplace and you can play with ground speed and air pressure and see what happens as you put different settings on your row unit and things along those lines. So there's a couple of you out here that uh, have some brown paper bags in your hand. Could you bring those up to us, please? And you have to tell me what's in your bag and then dump it into the bucket if you would, please. Okay, we got a little bit of corn. What color? Green. Green? I'm colorblind, that's why I have to ask you. Okay, we've got a different color of seed corn and they're super close to the exact same side like every bag of seed is, right? How many of you plant refuge corn separate from your regular corn? Are we planting the blends? Are they the exact same size? Probably not. M&Ms, did you eat any? Well, it's either sugar beets or M&Ms. <laughs> it's either sugar beets or M&Ms. <laughs> <laughs> it's not corn, he says. <laughs> Reese's peanut butter. Those are Reese's pieces. What'd you have in yours? Mini M&Ms. What'd you get? Tic Tacs, what flavor? Mint, good answer. <laughs> By the way, the saturated cold germ on the uh, Tic Tacs is not very good. And we got a big mix of corn. All right, now there's no jokes or tricks here. I'm gonna try to get this on the camera so you can all see it. Okay, it's not a false bottom bucket or any, any magic. Give this to Matt and what Matt's gonna do is put this in a V-set two and he's gonna use this disc right here. Okay, this is the corn disc that we use. So we're putting Tic Tacs, you know the size of those, all the way to Reese's Pieces and whatnot and a different set of corn seed. And we're gonna tell the monitor to plant 25,000 on a 30 inch row. We're gonna plant with 11 vacuum for 250 seeds. Go ahead and let's see what happens. What you wanna watch is in the top center of this screen, the singulation box. And I'm looking for zero skips and zero doubles. Down at the bottom, you can see the vacuum level I'm running and then you get to see the report live of all the seeds coming out of that meter. Green plants are good, X's are skips. Red plants are doubles and yellow says I got a little bit too close to my neighbor. We're gonna run those 250 seeds and then I have to make a choice as I'm out in the field with that mess of a seed lot. Now when I started planting this spring, 
I had 60 pound rounds, so big as your thumbnail rounds, right? Piece of cake to plant those. When we finished, we were trying to get some earlier hybrids and the only thing we could get was a 32 pound flat. I didn't know they made those and they're hard to plant. So for those of you that have vac planters, what should we do? We had 101 skips or 107 skips. Increase vac. So what it's telling us on that monitor is I expected a seed to be in that hole right there. And when it got over here to let go, there was no seed. So one of two things has happened. I'm either not getting the seed loaded when it's coming through the seed pool or something's knocking it off in between there. Matt, we're gonna turn vacuum to 28 and try it again and see what happens. Okay, down to the bottom, you see the vacuum coming up. We'll let that adjust and then we're gonna test it again and see what happens. Now I promise there's no camera tricks, there's none of that kind of stuff. You can replicate this at home on a test stand if you'd like. But we're gonna run 250 seeds. Oh man, we threw a double. So much for perfection today, Matt. So we go from 108 errors to one and we never even stopped the tractor. All we did was reach over and turn the vac up or turn the vac down. I don't change anything inside of that meter and I can handle anything that I've got. It's pretty simple, okay? We don't change discs for corn. If you need a different crop to plant, I have sugar beet plates and I have a wheat plate and a canola plate. There's an undrilled plate if you want one for hemp. All those are laying up here when you get done. The guys for hill drop cotton, those are up here as well. Peanuts, uh, large edibles, whatever. All I have to do is turn that meter now. Okay, and when my chain on my field ready planter looks like this when I take it off, I know we're gonna be in trouble. The best lubrication for that is a bolt cutter. Just cut it right off in half and throw it away and go get a new one, they don't cost that much. Once we release it out of the meter, all it has to do is get to the bottom of the furrow and it's really simple. Make sure the bottom of the seed tube is not obstructed or have any hangnails on it that could possibly move that, that uh, spacing of that planter. Okay, seed is down at the bottom, planter's leveled off. We've got a great furrow. Now Matt's gonna talk to us about how to destroy that properly. Morning. That's pretty fun, wasn't it? I think we just showed that we, something that would destroy every meter <laughs> right there. So we don't know how good that would plant. So nice to be here. My name is Matt Bennett. I'm excited to talk to you guys a little bit about this, but a common sense approach, isn't it? So based off those kind of calls, those kind of problems that Troy and I see where technology is deployed, we're trying to break these down and kind of show some of these things, all right? Now, I'll start here with the closing system. This one's a little bit easier because we can see it, right? When Troy's talking about, you know, getting an eighth inch variance here, a sixteenth variance here, and you add those up, and that's what equals five-eighths of an inch of depth, this one's a little bit different. I don't have to break into this, do I? All right? So how many of us feel like we spend a lot of time from this bolt back on our planter? Not much, do we? Why? Well, we really don't understand what's happening for the most part, do we? The other thing is it's such a small component of the overall complexity of what's happening in a field, we don't spend a lot of time on it, so it's okay. So I'll walk you through some of the stuff that I see and I think is very common to miss. Um, when I walk into your shop, and I've, I'm there to inspect the planter. I will have that planter lowered. I'll walk up with my steel toe boots and I'll kick that planter row unit right back there at the wheel. All right, I'm not picking on you, but I wanna, I wanna jar that system and see if it will move and not come back to where it's supposed to be. That's gonna immediately tell me whether I've got a bushing wear problem. Now you guys have seen this, this row unit. You have an idea what this is gonna look like as I move that, right? Look at that. All right, so I am sure when I remove that bolt, I'm way past replacement time. All right, so that would be kind of the integrity of the row unit, all right? I wanna see the spring isn't hanging, right? The closing system's intact. I don't have a lot of play. I'm still tight with my bushing and pivot points. What happens here is if I have a circle and I have a system that's supposed to rotate through that circle, what happens when that's oblong? Do you think it does this the same? Probably doesn't, does it, right? So there's some sensitivity there that we need to be aware of. The easy thing to fix is gonna be the alignment issue, all right? I've got a closing system that I want to destroy the furrow and encapsulate the seed. Pretty simple. I need to make sure that it's centered over the furrow I create. 
I've said simple several times. My job is, in essence, very simple. Do you know that there's only two types of closing systems? All right. First one's case IH. You have a horizontal closing system. You force two discs in the ground to the seating depth or below, and you close a trench this direction. Everybody else does this. I'm going to send a force line into the ground, hit below the seat, and I'm going to collapse the trench from the bottom up. All right, pretty simple. But if my wheels are not centered over the trench, I'm not doing it right. All right, what if I have an, an aggressive wheel? I know without asking that about 70% of the room has at least one aftermarket closing wheel. And a lot of those are aggressive. Maybe they have a spike or a spoke. All right, so I want to make sure that I'm not running that through the trench I just created. I could unplant seed really fast, couldn't I? All right, so like most things, you can kick it in the shop, but I'd put it in motion, take a look at it, get behind and dig. I think one of the reasons we don't spend a lot of time here is we don't dig enough seed. Now, I know you're going to tell me, hey, we dig seed. How many seeds you dig? I, dig, I dug eight, ten seeds. That's awesome. There's 2.4 million of them in this 40-acre field. All right, we're a little blind to it. All right, it's okay, but I would understand that digging across a trench is going to give me the grade of how my closing system is performing in the field conditions of that day. We're really good about digging down a row or cheating. We'll take this guy and get him out of the way, put a ratchet strap, leave an open trench, and I want to make sure that my seed stops when my clutch is right. I want my neighbors to see how pretty my corn is. There's no overplant. There's no gap. We spent money. We deployed that technology, and we want it to work. But we do a really bad job of digging across a row. All right? It's tough. I get it. You know, we got to go, go, go. All right? Time's important. Other closing systems, we might have some other attachment points that will look. We'll look at those the same way as a bushing. Wheel wear. You guys that have an aftermarket system... You got it. It was the best thing since life spread. Probably was for your conditions. But we probably threw the instructions away, didn't we? What is our replacement? Is it an overall diameter? Am I watching for a bevel to go away? What is it? Check those because if they're no longer in that spec, they're probably not moving the soil the correct way that was intended. All right? This one's kind of fun because you can obviously see that wheel's probably not going to spin true. I'm not getting my pressure line. Now, this one's a little bit worse. I've been playing with this all week, so I think that I've elongated this one, and this one's probably going to die for the end of the week because <laughs> I keep pulling on it. But there's definitely some wear issues. So be aware of that. I'm asking it to do something. The last time that I can really influence the seed, I want to make sure I've got my best foot forward there. All right? How about spacing? This is another big one. Now, this one I'll pick on new planters because I've seen this numerous times. I think maybe when they're a, a putting the closing system on, one guy starts on one side, another guy starts on the other, and they meet in the middle, and the gap's not necessarily the same. All right, so the geometry that's provided for us on the back of this wheel system or closing system is going to have a lot to do with how I can affect the soil. So with this type of closing system, for a corn planting depth, I probably want two and a half inches total spacing. All right, an inch and seven eighths bolt with the head. I carry one in my pocket because it fits right down in there. It's about two inches overall because I know on a dual rubber or a dual cast system, right at two inches between them is what I want. If I get too narrow, all right, so on the narrow one up there, about an inch and a half inch spacing, that would be ideal for narrow or shallow planted seeds. So if I'm planting cotton or soybeans, how many of us change between beans and corn on their closing system? All right, so there's, that happens, right? So if I'm too narrow, I will do a great job of closing the top of the trench. I run out of geometry to get below the seed depth, especially if I'm planting two inches deep, and I will close and pinch at the top, and I have the possibility of leaving an air pocket. I've now changed my emergence factor, right? I am not uptaking heat and moisture at the same rate as one that's encapsulated. If I get too wide, I move that invisible pressure line out further and I do a great job crushing the bottom of the trench, but I leave inverted at the top. I've effectively changed seeding depth, haven't I? At that point, I'm requiring some environmental condition to move soil back on top of the seed to keep my depth uniform. All right, so it's something important. Definitely check that 
you're, there's some money to be left there. What about pressure settings? Well, I'm going to show you guys something we've never even seen. So we kind of dealt with this a little bit last week, uh, a little bit before and a lot last week as we were putting this presentation together over the last couple of weeks and really spent some time on this. Has anybody weighed their closing pressure before? So I want you guys to think of this as a block test, but it's a block test for the weight of the system. So what you're going to see here, we've lowered a row unit down. We're lifting up the closing system, and we're putting a bathroom scale, space age technology, okay? And we're going to measure the amount of force that that system has given us. Now, without going any further, does anybody think I'm going to find a lot of variance? Yeah, you betcha. Here's what I'll tell you. A standard in the spring manufacturers is a 10% variance. The, this one and this one made right next door to each other. And there's a 10% difference in the amount of tension. Did I didn't know that. So it's kind of in, inherently kind of a sloppy system right to begin with. So 12 row planer, this planer's on site. And I've got two other ones that are gonna be included in the study. They're right here in the parking lot. You don't have to go far to see them. All right, so in this one's bottom, so I got all 12 of my rows. I've got two colored bars going up, going up. Notch one is the dark green, notch three is the light green, and then on the left hand side going up, those are the weights, okay? So what we found in notch one, that from the high to the low, we had a 20 pound variance. I don't know if that feels like a big deal or not. We'll go a little bit further. When I went up to notch three, from the high to a low, I had a 25 pound variance. I thought it was kind of amazing to me that that spring reacted differently because it's not the same row. Did you guys notice that? So that spring reacted differently as I stretched it, didn't it? Interesting. Now, row three is not up there. You see that missing? This field ready planner that we purchased, and I don't know where my here it is. My lever was in backwards on that row. And what we found is that it decreases the amount of weight applied by about 10 to 15 percent across the planter. So we didn't need it, so we threw it out. So that's bad data. I just want to point out to you guys that that planter planted in 2019. All right. So what does this mean? Why is this a big deal? Jason Webster spoke this morning. He shared some 2019 data. This is one of the slides he might have used in 2018 data. And what he did is he went out and tested the exact same closing system across the farm. And what he found was there was a true winner. There was a huge difference between notch one and notch two in the 2018 planning season. The problem with this data is I feel very confident telling you that when you go to plant spring 2020, that there is a pressure setting or amount of downforce you're carrying with your closing system that is going to beat another one. My issue is I can't tell you what. So the only thing I can tell you is after you harvest what you should have done. All right, and that's really what it's telling us. What this, should is, what this really is telling us is we gotta dig and examine, can I find the trench? Is it destructed? Is the seed floating? Or can I pick out those sidewalls? All right, because there's a cost. All right, one notch difference was a big deal. All right, let's take it a step further. Back to our study here. We measured all three planters, and what we found is for every notch you move this, the weight applied went up 18 pounds. That was the average. So a notch was worth 18 pounds. Notch one to notch two in 2018 was $92 an acre. 18 pounds of downforce is applied by notch. My average air on the three planters that I measured was 1.25 notches. How many of you guys like having no control? Tough, isn't it? You ever do a, a, you know, a, a plot, compare a couple things on your farm? You ever compare just a couple rows? <laughs> Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Right? Were those conditions the same? So we'll go to monitoring. All right? So as we think through this, I stole this from Troy. He probably stole it from someplace else. Jeff Rich said, 
If you think education is expensive, just try ignorance. All right, now ignorance is bliss though, right? And I don't want to hear this, okay? We've got to keep an eye on what's going on. All right? Now, I'm going to take you guys down a path here a little bit, all right? You guys, you feel all right right now? This might hurt a little bit, okay? But why is it important to monitor what's happening with the planner? I don't have to ask you if you have a planner monitor. I know you have a planner monitor, all right? So let's do a little example, all right? I got four girls. They're getting big. But we used to do a lot of pretending, so pretend with me here for a second, all right? I got a 16-row, 30-inch planter. I intend to plant 34,000 seeds per acre. I'm going to drive my planter at five miles per hour, and I paid $300 for a bag of seed corn. Am I close? Oh, I love it when the nods happen. Oh, this one's going to hurt you. I'm sorry. What do you think? At that speed, that rate, I'm asking that planter to plant 15 seeds per second each row. All right, there's 80,000 seeds in the bag. So you guys get your calculators out. If you take 80,000 and $300 bag, you're going to go up 0.00375. A little over a third of a penny for every seed you pay $300 for a bag if there's 80,000 in there. You guys with me so far? Has anyone ever spilled seed corn? You better pick it up, <laughs> okay? Clean it off. And put it in the planter. You pay dearly for it. All right? Now, where this kind of falls apart is I'm going to tell you without diesel, nitrogen, the tractor costs, the farmhand, anything else, you're spending 80 cents, 86 cents a second to plant corn. And sometimes it hurts. And sometimes you're like, all right, no big deal. Troy's guy in South Dakota is shaking in his chair right now. All right, so let's put it in terms you might understand better. Do we understand cost of an hour better? Do you ever pay anything by the second? Right? So cost of an hour, farmhand, 10 to $20. I'm just using generalizations. So if you're making seven bucks, don't hit your boss right now. Matt Bennett, no, no. Okay. How about a service call? Can anybody relate to this? Something's not right. I got a sensor, a light's on. I call them out. Here comes the truck, the guy in the uniform, hooking up stuff, fixing my tractor. 130 bucks an hour. You ever pay an accountant? How about $175 an hour? Anybody ever hire a lawyer? That's three to four hundred dollars an hour. It depends on what you did, <laughs> okay? Because that can get really expensive. Now, re relax. It's convictions that matter, okay? Now, how many of you have ever kept an hourly time clock on somebody, whether it's someone working in the house, maybe you got a construction guy, you got a guy digging a trench, you're paying by the hour, and you're like, you know, that joker turned in 20 hours, and I know he counted a full hour, and he left 15 minutes early and showed up half hour late. You, know, you ever do that? Now, let's think about that type of management and keeping an eye on it. Now, let's compare. What do you think it costs to plant corn per hour? <whistles> Does this hit? we got to know what's going on, don't we? Okay? We know, we've know we known this for a long time. Hey, this is the age test. Has anyone ever seen this before? This was cutting-edge technology. First in class. This is a go, no-go planner monitor. For the younger generation out there, you could not connect to the internet, none of that stuff. This was a light, and the light, all it said was, something's happening. I've got a sensor here, and something fell down it, whether it was a piece of corn cob or a seed, but it broke it. Now, it didn't have spacing on it, and that's a good thing, because remember the eyes used to stick out in the seed tube, and every seed would hit it and do this? So we were probably a little bit better. But you could defeat that technology by a rodent but it was much better than the metal lid with the thing sticking out Then you could just turn around and see if there was seed leaving the boxes. Right? Space age, right? So today, you guys all have a planter monitor. All right? You know that what my population is. You probably know some type of a graph or information that's some spacing or singulation. All right? Because we're paying so much money 
you've got to have the monitoring. All right, I want to know what each row is doing, what the singulation is. We showed you the metering technology, not that you're ever going to go plant M&Ms and Tic Tacs in the same field. We plant M&Ms in their own field, right? But we need to know what's going on. All right, the technology advancements were way past this go, no-go monitor. Here's my problem. All those things that are listed up there that you can measure. Does anybody out here feel like they understand their monitor 100%? Like I could come up and teach a class on it? I can make this technology like a no-go-go -go planner monitor. Do you know that stuff that came with it? It was wrapped in cellophane. It came in the box when you got your monitor. That is not a collector's item. That is an owner's manual. Open it up. If I don't understand it, ask questions. Because this technology gets defeated by a lack of education. And it is fair for you to look at me and say, Matt, I only use it three weeks out of the year. I get that. But let's figure out how to make it better. Because it doesn't matter how passionate I am and how important in the fact that it costs you $3,096 an hour to plant seed. I cannot fix the loose screw between the tractor seat and the steering wheel. It doesn't work that way. This is the decision that's made with you guys. So the reason I want to make a point of this is it doesn't matter what kind of planter you have. Whether it's a green, a red, a white, or a blue. They all have these pitfalls that are hidden. They all have mechanical pieces that wear. They all have places where I lose a sixteenth here and an eighth here, and all of a sudden I'm off by five-eighths of an inch in depth. I all have a closing system that I've got springs that aren't where they're supposed to be. I have refuge in a bag that is sorted by genetics because I can't have 114 with 90. And I, can't, I want them all flats, but it doesn't happen that way. All right, They try their best, so I need to be able to plant what's in the field, what's in the bag, and have confidence, and I need to be able to monitor it. All right. If you struggle with the education part and you said, you know, that guy's got a point, go to our website, enter your zip code, a calendar will pop up and it will tell you on this date, at this time, at this location, this guy is having a planner monitor training clinic. This guy at this time is having a full maintenance clinic. If you don't have our monitor, that's fine. Monitor your planner, but find the information you need. Do not use the excuse, I only use it three weeks out of the year. You're spending $3,000 an hour to plant corn with just the seed. Get it right. All right? We have a minute and 43 seconds. That means probably one question. So Troy's going to join me here. I will do my best. You're going to have to probably shout because I can't hardly see. Is there any questions or did we just do that good a job? No, you cannot eat the seed. With that trail mix we made, you don't want it. So I would say it this way. We know that it's going to change. Repeat the question. Please. Oh, sorry. The question was, do we, do we feel like we have a good recommendation for how much force should be applied to a closing system to get the correct trench closed? That, did I do pretty good? So I would say that, and I'm, all right, I'm going to get out my agronomy degree. It depends, right? I, I think that that's the statement. I'm a lawyer. Yeah, I'm a lawyer now. I don't, I'm, I'm probably not in that three to $400 range, though. I'm, I'm probably like the $8 guy. Although I would have an awesome commercial. I know my commercial would be awesome. It'd be on Sunday night, really late at night, too. Troy would be the bail bond guy, too. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't want to use it as, as a cop-out. But obviously, if I'm in a coarse soil environment with sand, or I'm in a dry environment or if I'm in a heavy residue or a gumbo soil, those are all going to be very different things. What I can tell you is um, we'll set what we think looks right, or what I will tell people, do what you've always done, and then we're going to go dig. The issue that we have with the closing system is it's a cumbersome thing to change. Now, I will encourage you to research and change wheels. If something kind of sings to you, you can probably put it on two or three rows and test it. Because your planer's not going to pull uneven if I, if I change closing wheels on 13, 14, 15, 16. 
but try it, you know. Uh, but get out and dig. Can I find the V? If I can find the V, I'm probably going to notch down. If I find the, a gap, I'm probably going to re-examine this dimension right here. Right? Did I close it? I think to, to add to that, Matt, when we specifically talk about furrow force that you're seeing on these rows here, the key difference that you're going to find is there's a sensor back there to tell you if it's starting to float out of the profile. And as that weight starts to come away, you know that that first stage disc is coming up and that we're not getting the force to get down at to the depth and to start moving that soil back together. So I, I think we know that we're losing contact very much like what we have on the downforce system. It's about the same learnings. It's a lot of the same background coding that says, yes, we need to make sure we keep that unit in the ground. Now the exact pressure, we probably don't know that for any given condition at this mm -hmm. point. I think we'll learn a lot of that this year. We learned a ton last year in 2019's really, really bad conditions. Um, the planting season was six months long for us. We started with Texas uh, in early January, and I think we ended in the Dakotas and up north late, late, late June, if not into July. And there was a lot of different opportunities to learn on really sticky clays and really soft sands and all these different pieces that were inside of that on what that uh, what that's going to look like. So specifically on our system, I think we've got a pretty good idea because there's actually a sensor back there. On the other ones, it's, it's still going to be manually digging back there to see again if we have that V. I think so. And they, I, now they will talk, sorry Matt, um, they will talk more about soil density and the closing process in one of your coming sessions here this afternoon. So you get some more detail and depth on that. Um, closing wheel studies that we shared in the past, um, Corey Mulbauer, who you guys will go to next, there were several planters that had every kind of row unit, every kind of closing system, started in Texas and ended up in North Dakota. So they just moved these planters and they came up with a couple findings and I'm gonna share one of them that's fact. And one of them, was, the fact one was, in good soil conditions, they all worked pretty well. So if you could optimize soil conditions, closing became less of a factor. I think that's one of the reasons 19 is always going to stand out as like a great year to measure closing system because we were running wet. The other thing that we found is we had three winners that when we did a stand environment or a stand count percentage, we had a Great Plains, a Dawn, and a Cast Cast system that scored really well right near the top. Now if I asked you what those three things had in common without being a smart aleck and tell me they're round, they have mass. So the part that I'm gonna make an assertion on that I don't know is fact, and this is gonna be my personal opinion, is that as a farming community, we run too light back here. This system only weighs about five pounds with the bolts included. If I go put on a 25 pound wheel, I'm sitting 50 pounds or 45 pounds ahead of this right off the bat. So notch one all of a sudden is 75 pounds or 72 pounds to notch three in this type of system that gets me to 65, 68. Right, we have the same amount relative, because we know there's difference in springs, we covered that, right? But wherever we start with the weight of our wheels, the amount we can move it is set. So we can start with a heavier wheel and move that movement here. In a lighter wheel, we max out, don't we? So I think there's a lot of things. It's gonna come down to your soils and digging. And don't be afraid to, to play around on your own farm. Yep. All right, so what we're going to do is we will take a break. Um, you've got 10, 10 to 12 minutes, somewhere in that neighborhood. Our next session is...